I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Uh, Frank Galgano. He's chair of the Department of Geography and the Environment. He retired from the U.S. Army in 2007 as a lieutenant colonel after 27 years of service with experience in tank and cavalry units. He served in Germany, Kentucky, Texas, Saudi Arabia, Kansas, and most recently at the U.S. Military Academy where he was an academy professor and director of, ge of the geography program. Dr. Galgano is a physical geographer with expertise in coastal geomorphology, military geography, and environmental geography. He's published six books, three physical geography study guides, and more than 20 professional articles focused on geographic and military subjects. He's currently preparing a manuscript with his co-editor, Colonel Eugene Palka, for a new military geography book, which will be published in the fall of 2010. Uh, he's, his, current research involves <laughs> his current research involves the study of linkages between the environment and regional stability and conflict. So, thank you. Please welcome Dr. Galgano. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's just take a second. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction, Sue. The book will, the book will be out soon. <laughs> I keep telling myself soon. Well, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the natural environment in, in Haiti, specifically about its environmental hazards. And, and soon I got to talking about this over the summer uh, in conjunction with this uh, conference because you know Haiti is a is a great. And can everybody hear me if I if I stand over here? I don't talking to that microphone. Um, it's a very complex environment in Haiti. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, one of the things we used to tell our cadets at West Point is you can make your own history, but you can't change your geography. And unfortunately, <laughs> that's true for Haiti, just simply where it is on, on the earth. Uh, first of all, blesses it with great resources, but also uh, burdens it with uh, great problems in, in just terms of its, its environment and where it's, it's located. Um, so again, we mentioned the island of, of Hispaniola. Hey, you know, again, everybody I'm sure is aware of this. Haiti's on this side of the island, Dominican Republic on that side of the island, located in the, uh, the, the greater Antilles part of the Caribbean chain. And again, this is all a function of its seismicity and tectonics. Um, as Barbara mentioned, Haiti is the poorest state in the hemisphere. Uh, it experiences a number of problems depending on your reference as, as much as 80% unemployment, uh, as many as 90% of the people living below the poverty line. That's sort of the worst end of, of where, where what, what I discovered by looking at this a little bit more closely. I've never been to Haiti. Um, my son was there uh, last spring flying around a helicopter delivering supplies uh, as part of the relief mission, but I, I've never been there myself, so I'll say that up front. But um, it, it has a, all of the problems that, that I'm, I'm interested in, in examining. As, as Sue mentioned, I look at environmental security as one of my research threads. I, I have two things. I, I go to the beach. I study beach erosion and stuff like that. That's the fun part. Um, <laughs> although you do have to go a lot in the winter, and the beach is not that much fun in the winter. But uh, the other issue is this, this problem of environmental security, and, and Haiti is a great example of that. Uh, it, it, it really is the nexus of government, the environment, environmental change, people, meaning latent political and ethnic issues. Uh, and all of these things come together in Haiti for a variety of reasons that make it, a, a, as we've seen in the last, certainly, 20 years, uh, sort of perhaps one of the more unstable places, certainly in, in our hemisphere here. In terms of, it's uh, right now about 1, 142 out of 189 states in the uh, UN's Human Development Index. Uh, in terms of the World Bank's governance scores, the, the World Bank scores states um, based on six areas of governance. Haiti is in the bottom 25 of the 203 states and state entities that it looks at. In terms of its uh, government accountability and corruption, it's in the bottom 10, uh, even today. Um, so. Haiti does face a number of significant problems along with its problematical natural environment, even if everything was strong and fine in terms of Haiti, right? It, 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 is, it is in a tough spot in the world, quite literally, where, where it's located. So we will take a look at some of those things 
to set the stage. This is uh, from the space, courtesy of our friends in the space shuttle, this digital elevation model. Right here, I'm going to go ahead and click off the lights sure. here a little bit so we can kind of, I'll, I'll try to memorize which one this is. You can see this perhaps a little bit better. Um, so this is the earthquake that it, and we'll come back to this, that it experienced on the 12th of January 2010. It's a magnitude 7 earthquake, which is, again is very powerful. Um, made worse because of some other ongoing issues in Haiti. Uh, it occurs along a fault line that you can, if you look at the geography right here, you can see it quite plainly. It's right here in this grobin right here is the geomorphic term for this between where the fault travels. It's the EPG fault, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, the epicenter of the fault is right here, and the city is about 16 miles from Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Um, these are some of the numbers associated with this quake. Uh, immediately about 3 million people displaced. The death toll, a very wide disparity. Voice of America, I found 92,000 at the low end, 20, about... Um, 230,000 at the upper end. This is by the Haitian government and MSNBC. And you can see the, the key here, though, is not w which number is correct. It is a large, uh, certainly tragic event for, for the state of Haiti. Uh, the movement along this fault was about 1.8 meters. So the entire ground for about 64 kilometers shifted 1.8 meters. So the release of pure energy uh, during this event is, is quite problematical, as, as we will find out. Okay. Is it okay if I leave the lights about this low? Because we have a couple of images to look at, and you'll, you'll see them a little bit better. Um, our view from space, this is from the Econo satellite. This is a four-meter multispectral image, meaning that Things that are about four meters and larger, you can kind of see. So you should be able to see, again, the resolution of the screen and the projector, not that terrific, uh, but it is, it is a very clear image. This is the uh, palace here. Um, just to show you, one of the things that this is picking up is in this area right here. So this would be soil and human-made objects. This upper curve is vegetation. So it's measuring very highly right here. So the brighter areas are basically bare soil or concrete and other things like that, as you can pick up quite readily here, the amount of devastation. Pretty much every building has collapsed in, in, in central downtown Port-au-Prince where this is uh, taken. And um, of course, for those of you who are familiar with this, per perhaps have been there, you know, one of the difficulties uh, the relief efforts face was just literally getting relief supplies into the city because of this roads were blocked, things kind of collapsed uh, and one of the things my son ended up doing was of course flying things into various places in this area right here. Uh, this is sort of a image, this is from a GUI which runs the, uh, the uh, Konos uh, satellite. This is remarkably, they have remarkable luck this satellite company, this is a commercial satellite. Uh, they happen to be directly overhead during the, the tsunami in 2004 and actually got the tsunami. <laughs> Talk about interesting luck. Uh, so they were the satellite happened to be overhead, right at pretty much on uh, the next day. This is the air, main airport on the 13th, um, and there it is. Then three days later, uh, as the relief effort started moving in, you can kind of see some interesting changes in the airport. Uh, you can notice starting to set up uh, various infrastructure in the area. These are C-17s. Uh, a little bit hard to see, but there's all the helicopters here. Um, so uh, this is my son was based out of this area uh, during the relief operations. Um, but again, a, a very powerful earthquake, certainly, um, following Haiti. So if we take a look at Haiti's natural environment, so what are we going to look at uh, during uh, my short presentation today? Well, we can talk a little bit about where is climate, ecology, and population, which all become very important. And in terms of natural hazards, it's difficult to talk about earthquakes without talking about hurricanes. And you'll, you'll see the connection here in a moment. And then uh, leading into Magan's uh, talk, I'll talk a little bit about environmental degradation, uh, which is really one of Haiti's principal enduring problems that we have uh, right now. And, and you know, uh, to steal Jared Diamond's term, you know, this problem of ecocide, are they really just literally killing their own environment, um, which is sort of a problem. So, 
A little bit about its geographic orientation, Haiti, of course, located here. Uh, this is one, you'll see in a moment, one of the most complex tectonic boundaries in the world, okay? Haiti is a seismically formed island, uh, so yeah, it, it means it's formed by tectonic activity, earthquakes, volcanism, and, and, and everything else. So it, it, it will forever be exposed to earthquake problems, much like uh, California is for us. Uh, it's right here at the confluence of the trade winds. Uh, it's got a warm, constant temperature, you see, which really, the, it's, its seismicity and things along tectonic boundaries mean that, you know, beneath the soil, you're blessed with natural resources, okay? <laughs> Metamorphosis of rock generates all kinds of interesting uh, natural resources that uh, some people can exploit and use for economic development. Its confluence here in the trade winds were readily recognized by the Europeans as they moved in there. It's a wonderful place to grow. Uh, things, as you'll see, it has two peaks of precipitation. So this is January, this is December to take us through the year. So you, you do have two peaks. Constant temperature, as you can see throughout the year. So this is in centimeters and degrees uh, Celsius. And if you look at it, they get about 50.9 inches of rain. Uh, to, by comparison here in the Villanova area, we get on average about 41 inches of rain per year. So, uh, and the 10 inches is relatively significant. Uh, they are fortunate because it is a mountainous island. It does, it, it should keep down uh, most uh, disease, uh, certainly vectors, uh, although but with the destruction of the forest, they've sort of changed that dynamic a little bit. Um, so it is a remarkable place. And based on its natural sort of land cover, we should expect to see uh, basically uh, much of it is going to be, it's, it's a function of elevation in Haiti versus in the United States as a function of latitude, the way vegetation changes. So as you go up in elevation, you'll go from tropical forest to semi-deciduous tropical forest to a tropical savanna, basically a woodland. In other words, a mixture of grass and trees in its natural state, which really doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but because it's seismic in nature, because of this rainfall pattern and these temperatures, it should be a fully sustainable environment in terms of its agriculture, in terms of everything else and wood production, water, fish, uh, but again, problems of population, problems of governance, governance, land tenure, which forces people into marginal lands. Haiti, unfortunately, is exceeding the sustainable rate of extraction for all of these particular commodities as we will take a look at and see. And again, this is a, a again, courtesy, of this is a digital elevation model developed off the space shuttle mission about five years ago. Uh, Port-au-Prince located right here. This is this low-lying land feature here created by this fault that pretty much tracks along there. But high elevations, um, the other main fault that we'll see is running right over here. So there's two of them that they have to deal with. But um, in both cases, because of the, the trade winds, and as you may or may not know, the, the trade winds strike the island in two different directions as the pressure, main pressure belts shift, meaning unlike many places in the Caribbean, and in, at this sort of latitude right here, as we get into 30 and 40 degrees north latitude, uh, there really is no dry season, okay? So we have a, an area that's very conducive to agriculture, good soils, lots of rain, and of course, as you know, as winds move up slope, you, you tend to get more precipitation, and then because of the, the shift in the winds later on, we don't end up with a rain shadow effect. So the best example I can give is the American West. Coastal California, very wet. You go over the coastal range, very dry. Okay, that's the rain shadow. Uh, you don't experience this here in Haiti because the winds will come in and shift each season. Uh, so again, it, its location being very important. So here is another, this is a Landsat image. So this has a spatial resolution of about 79 meters. So buildings may, may or may not be able to see. Uh, and, and so I guess things about the size of a football field you can see in this image here. But uh, one of the things we'll point out though is, and we'll have one of the full island later, Haiti has this remarkable brown complexion to it. Again, most of the vegetation is gone. As, you know, uh, some, uh, I just read a report published by the Canadian equivalent of the State Department published 
about six months ago, they estimate that there's only 1% of the natural vegetation left in Haiti. Uh, the USDA says only about 3%, and I guess most of it's in a small park located in this area right over here. Uh, very briefly, its population uh, becomes important. U.S. Census Bureau says about 9 million right now. Uh, its 2010 growth rate is minus 1%, mostly because of net migration out of the country right now. Its birth rate, its total fertility rate is very high, life expectancy not so much. Um, and as you, Barbara mentioned right here, again, this map's a little bit difficult to see. You know, you're talking upwards of 500 to 1,000 people per square mile. You can see Haiti has got the darkest colors in the hemisphere, clearly. I mean, aside from sort of the large cities on the, in the United States or perhaps one or two other places. Port-au-Prince is growing at a rate faster than most of the world's mega cities right now. Again, mostly because of high birth rates and net migration into the city. Uh, but in terms of really population dynamics, if we think of a demographic model here, and we have um, sort of birth rates on one curve, death rates on the other, so we'd expect death rates to start to decrease. As a country gets more developed, birth rates will remain relatively high for a period and decrease. So most, according to this model, most developed countries are sort of in this stage right here, and we're sort of about even growth right now. Haiti seems to be, if we look at these two projections right here, 2010, this is the classic developing state. Down here in the lower cohorts, this is by age at five-year increments. So we have a very, very large birth rate, which again supports this part of our growth curve right there. But as we look at the U.S. Census Bureau 2050 projection, those birth rates remain very, very high, meaning they're perpetually kind of stuck in this area right here. And again, so we're, we're seeing large population growth, again, as, and as we'll find out with some economic uh, problems. All right, let's get to natural hazards then, and we'll see how this all comes together. So here's a nice natural hazard map. We can see Haiti right here. It's, you know, it's along the principal tropical storm track in the Western Hemisphere. It's subject to tsunamis in, in relation to its earthquakes. And even if, you know, there, you can see these dots are sort of earthquakes. Although Haiti itself, not subject to many seism large seismic events, everywhere else around it is, and, the, and they suffer uh, equally with that. So very briefly about hurricanes, and this is a, a good shot, this is Hurricane Igor, Igor um, from, the, from the space station, it's a great shot of the eye of the, the hurricane right there, I'll give you an interesting shot, but as so we look at this image right here, these are the principal storm tracks for the last century, some of them known, some of them reconstructed uh, from data, you know, Haiti is, is, is right there in the middle of all of that. Um, so Haiti is subjected to rarely extratropical storms. Those are most of the storms that we see here at our latitude. They get some of them in the winter when the jet stream pushes down. But again, they're rare. But they, they do get, on average, of about uh, hurricane strikes, about two to three per year. Okay, United States, we get about six. But again, we get a much larger coastline where they strike. So um, by comparison, the United States, it's about a... It's about a billion dollars every time a hurricane strikes the United States coast. Uh, and again, it's spread out over a large country. They get two or three a year, okay? Uh, and in the terms of tropical storms and depressions, they get about a total of 26 strikes a year. Um, some of them are, are not quite large and, and not necessarily problematical. Lower lying areas, they suffer from storm surge and wave setup. The storm surge, of course, is the bubble of water created by low pressure in a storm, kind of comes on shore with the storm, floods everything. They do have this problem in the lower lying areas. Wave setup, Haiti is thankfully somewhat protected from that based on its orientation. The storms are moving from east to west. Most of the wave energy is coming from east to west and, and by the fact that Haiti is on the sort of western side of the island, it is shielded from most of that. But the real problem they have is heavy rains, lack of trees, heavy rains. On the order of, and let me make sure I get my number right, it is a remarkable number. They estimate uh, right now they lose about 61 square kilometers of soil every year because of runoff and erosion uh, based on the rainstorms. So, and this is just for your information, we're talking about storms that they mostly get are in this range right here. So you're talking about storm surges of about 12 feet to about 18 feet 
along with high winds and heavy rain. So again, you can take a look at Haiti. This is the last three years. This is from NOAA. Uh, took a direct hit in 2000. It's actually two direct hits in 2007. Um, one of them, this is, I believe, is Hurricane Number Six, is uh, yeah, Faye in 2008. Uh, and then, of course, the residual effects. Now, remember, just because the line doesn't go right over Haiti doesn't mean it doesn't. I'll show you an example. It doesn't suffer directly from the storm. 2009, which was, thankfully for all of us, a, a relatively light year in terms of hurricanes. Uh, this year, of course, is a slightly heavier year, as you're aware. We got one after another. Thankfully, most of them are staying out in the Atlantic for, for all of us. Um, but this is uh, Hurricane Earl. Uh, this is the MODIS satellite. Um, right here. So this is about 600 miles across, so you got the eye. Uh, this is probably around 300 miles right here. So again, even if the eye doesn't cross the island, it is still affected by heavy rains and winds. In fact, this is taken on the 31st of August. Um, this is from the uh, NRL out in Monterey. So there's Earl right there, and Earl kind of curved up this way. But again, you can see the impact of the storm is quite wide. So that, you know, the geographic footprint of one of these storms is about a thousand miles, okay? Rain, possible tornadic activity, uh, wave activity, and, and, and all. And again, we've got kind of an interesting, you can see them, hurricanes form right here off the coast of Africa. They're sort of like the line of elephants as they move towards us. And it's seemingly, we have three of them, tropical storm, tropical, tropical depression, and tor uh, hurricane one, one right after another uh, this particular year. Well, before I get to earthquakes, the, the connection between hurricanes and earthquakes, the point is, th this fault that we're going to talk about it, it has a recurrence interval of once every 250 years. That's its probability. It's, it's actually a little bit smaller than that. So Haiti, though, gets hit by two or three hurricanes every year. So much like the rest of the Caribbean basin, the way people build their homes is a direct relation of the number one threat that they face, which is the hurricane. Mm -hmm. Those of you who've been to the Outer Banks, perhaps it's the Jersey Shore. In the old days, they built houses the same way they do in the Caribbean. They're low-lying cement structures with a heavy cement roof. Or, 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 uh, so that's the way, you know, when you see the old houses on the Outer Banks, not these grand things that we built. They're low-lying, this way they stay out of the wind. Heavy, heavy structures so they can withstand the wind, and you want a nice flat roof so it doesn't blow away. This is exactly the wrong kind of building to have when you have an earthquake. It's very rigid. Okay, the, the building will begin to shake, the walls will give way, and the, the roof has a tendency to collapse all in one piece, you know, and flatten everything else underneath it. So the damage, of course, in this particular earthquake is intensified because of the building structures that they are, so again, the hurricane, this, the, uh, this uh, earthquake that we talked about may have, uh, they, they think it went in 1946, but before that it was in the late 1800s, the last time this earthquake actually uh, from this particular fault uh, affected the area. So again, you know, this idea of everything is sort of connected when we talk about these issues here. So again, in, 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 re in reaction to their principal threat, which is the, the hurricane, they built exactly the wrong structures to withstand the earthquake um, that we face. So if you take a look at the earthquakes, uh, you can see right here, and I'm going to show you this, you can see two confusing arrows. You see this arrow's pointing in this direction. That is, this map shows relative motion, so I just want you to ignore that uh, for a moment. But the, Haiti is principally here on the Caribbean plate, and it's in one of the most remarkably complex tectonic areas that there are in the world, perhaps only faced by the area right here off of Indonesia, probably. Um, but certainly you've got sort of subduction zones going on here, you have transcurrent falls here, subduction zone over there. And if we take a look at, I made this map, I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> Couldn't find a good one that I liked. But, um, so what you have here is, is Haiti sitting right here. So this is the North American plate moving in this direction at about 2.7 millimeters per year, moving. You got the Caribbean plate moving in this direction at about 0.8 millimeters per year. Mostly volcanic islands, Montserrat is in this area, which is, you know, has been highly eruptive very recently. Uh, the South American plate is moving in this direction, colliding with the Nazca plate moving in that direction. 
hence the formation of the Andes Mountains and the volcanic activity here. Uh, the Cocos Plate in this case is moving in this direction at 6.9 millimeters per year against the Caribbean Plate which is moving at 0.8 millimeters per year, so you have a collision there, okay? This is a lot like people on the Schuylkill, okay? <laughs> yeah, and one's moving faster than the other, but again, so you end up with this mountainous spine, all the volcanic activity and tectonic activity throughout the Central American area. And again, uh, Haiti's misfortune, here are these two faults that are really s located with this sort of transcurrent fault, or sometimes called a strike-slip fault. It's much like the San Andreas and the Hayward Fault that we see out in, in, the, in the west. And again, so those are the relative motions. If we look more closely at Haiti, this is the, the this one here is called the Oriente Fault. I don't know if I pronounced that right. But this is a, a leg of it called the, the Septentrional part of it, or better known as the SO Fault. <laughs> and again, so you have material moving in this direction, the North American plate moving in this direction, and then uh, Haiti's misfortune is you have this wing of Haiti moving in that direction, and this wing of Haiti moving in that direction. Uh, this fault has been stationary for about 250 years. That's sort of its inactivity. And again, on the 12th of January, that's, that's the way it moved. And again, you can kind of see the landforms line up quite nicely with these faults right here. And again, this sort of Graben, which is German for grave. Germans did a lot of the early work on this sort of stuff. Uh, you can see it from Google Earth, which is a great example here. You can see the trench system here. You can see the trench system here and the trench system here along these particular boundaries. Now, the side-by-side -side sliding motion that you see does a couple of things. It'll send a, again, 1.8 meters or about a yard and a half of movement along a 65 mile an hour stretch releases an enormous amount of energy. It causes the earth to shake. For those of you who've been to the beach or in your backyard, you know, if you ever stick a shovel in the beach and you shake it, you notice the water comes up to the surface. It liquefies the soil when that happens. So again, you have these large concrete buildings sitting, especially down in Port-au-Prince in that valley, which is all non-consolidated sedimentary soils, okay? All of a sudden, the soil liquefies. So not only is a shock wave moving through it, but all of a sudden everything's unbalanced and the buildings are now literally sinking in one end rising they crack and they, they, they collapse in on each other and that's essentially what causes most of the damage um, again for Haiti this is really not a big issue again you'll, you'll see the the uh, number of eruptions uh, again I yeah, put them right here 1860 we think well we know that it was we think there was a small one in 1946 although nobody's not really sure which one it was, but uh, 1751, we have historical evidence that it erupted then, 1770, so again, this is, in terms of a threat, really, uh, the Haitians perhaps rightfully ignore it based on their other priorities. Um, we've put in extensive building codes throughout the West Coast uh, to accommodate this sort of activity, uh, not so much in, in Haiti today. And again, from Google Earth, if we sort of dip it down, you can kind of see the fault running right through here. There's the gap between those two mountain ranges and uh, Port-au-Prince lying right there in between those two arms. See it right there. Okay, environmental degradation. The last part, one of the things that I study quite a bit. Uh, I study environmental security and here's a pretty good definition of what we mean by environmental security. Um, again, we're talking about instability and sometimes violent conflict, if we look at places like Rwanda and Darfur, okay, in part not triggered by environmental factors. Um, the environment typically does not cause wars, but it does contribute or certainly exacerbate conflict. So the idea here is we have this overarching environmental change that we're going through now. You can call it global warming, you can call it whatever you want, but certainly environmental change changes in our climates are also impacting issues of weak governance, extant poverty, large population growth, non-sustainable uh, use of the environment, and of course, any sort of latent human, ethnic, po political conflict in the area. Uh, and, and really, for Haiti, you know, again, we mentioned it is the poorest state in the, the Western Hemisphere. 
the latest World, Governance, World Bank governance scores, they actually called Haiti a sort of a kleptocratic state, again, because of it, its pervasive uh, corruption, um, which didn't leave, unfortunately, with uh, Papa Doc and Baby Doc. Um, it's, again, population growth. Environmental scarcity and land tenure has caused all kinds of mass migration into urban centers and in marginal lands on these very steep hill slopes. We see soil exhaustion, severe erosion, issues of water quality, mostly from sediment getting in the water, and of course we mentioned this issue of deforestation. So really one of the, the root cause here is essentially non-sustainable human practices. Uh, for the average Haitian though, this means not that they're bad people, it means that most of them don't have jobs, there's only 10% of the country has electricity, and, and the only way they can really make a living is by producing charcoal, which they either sell or use to, to cook their meals. Um, and so it is, a, it, for them, it's, it's a matter of, of survival. But really, the, the seminal issue here is deforestation. About 7 million people, burning on average of about, the equivalent of about 30 million trees per year. The problem is Haiti's environment, we think, can only sustain about 20 million trees growth annually. Uh, they far exceeded that. Uh, and, and the idea here is, is about in 2003, about 1,000 acres of natural forest are left. Uh, and this is a typical scene from, from Haiti. Uh, this is downtown Port-au-Prince. Again, the satellite image in which soil, the bright areas that you see here is following a mudslide after a, a, a tropical rain. And you'll see is anywhere is, you know, sort of two or three meters of mud inundating city streets and uh, causing all kinds of issues. The other problem with the lower, with uh, sort of exacerbating the problem here is when you take away the tree cover, it lowers the water table because, you know, when it rains, the trees catch the rain. It allows water to gently run down to the soil surface and it allows it to percolate down into the soils. Uh, the problem is when it's, it, two things happen when you deforest. The upper part of the soil tends to become slightly harder, as you all will probably experience in your garden after a, rain, you know, after a period of uh, dryness. So you have quick runoff, there's nothing to slow the amount, you get splash erosion, and you get, so very little water percolates down. So even during, so what you, you, you'd like to be able to depend on your water table to even out periods of drought. Problem is now, the lack of trees changes the hydrologic cycle, which causes the droughts to become more prolonged. And then, of course, you've lowered your water table, which now you, you're forced to chop down more trees to go to more different land and you know to grow crops. And so this thing is sort of sort of a, a, a sort of a vicious spiraling cycle of environmental degradation. Land tenure practices again. Most of the land ownership in Haiti is concentrated in a relatively small minority. And again, the large populations then are forced up into these hill slopes to either chop down the trees for <coughs> production of charcoal or to become a subsistence farmer. And, and again, this is highly marginal land. The soils are very thin, very uh, prone to erosion. And those are some of the problems we face. This is a land set up, uh, sorry, a land uh, space shuttle image of Haiti. And I, I wish the color was a little bit better here, but again, Haiti quite brown. And if you, you can see the colors here a little bit better, the Dominican Republic has a much, much greener, again, so we have differences in albedo. So Haiti tends to absorb more so solar energy. It makes the ground warmer, it makes drought more persistent. Uh, again, in Dominican Republic, you have more vegetative cover. It reflects more sunlight, lowers the temperatures, tends to make the droughts less persistent. And again, so the, that's a pretty good global shot of Haiti. So with that, I think we have about five or ten minutes or questions. About five minutes? About four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Any questions? Yes? Is anybody doing any kind of research or projects to see how you can um, increase that, the growth of the trees, like more than the 20 million per year that it can sustain now? Haiti has much the same problem that you have in Amazonia, okay? You have a couple of things that come together that make soils what they are. You have climate, you have parent material, in other words, what, what did the soil come from? Because of its seismicity, you have lots of metamorphic rock. There's lots of iron in the soil, which makes the soil very reddish in color. These are terrible soils to grow in. I mean, you know, so, you know, the, again, 
a, 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 a slash and burn farming. Why do you do that in tropical areas? And everybody thinks, oh, it's the tropics, it's lush. Well, it's lush because the trees have very deep roots and they have broad, to catch, so they, they're catching the water and the nutrients which are leaching away very quickly in all of this heavy rain. So the problem is, is you know, if you cut down 100 acres in this area and you, you burn the trees to put some nutrients in the soil, which are historically poor, okay, you can farm for a year or two and now the soil's exhausted and now you have to leave. You go to another 100 acres, you chop it down. In the meantime, behind you, this iron, these laterites is what they call, become almost iron hard. Soils become very, very hard on top. And it makes the regeneration of the forest very, very problematical. So you, you basically almost have to do natural progression here. Start with, you know, goldenrod and weeds and so the planting of trees. Because you have to regenerate that layer, the old horizon, the layer of topsoil on top, which is completely gone now. Uh, so you can't just go out there and plant a bobinga tree and hope that it grows again. It's not. Um, so, yes? Considering all these issues, what would be a sustainable practice for me or sustainable something that would, other than, I mean, I heard the golden rod and the weeds, but... Well, I, I think, you know, I mean, the, the people are mostly attacking the forest to, to get energy. You know, only 10% of the country has electricity. so. Again, it seems rather simple. No, they're not, the, the solution to these problems are never that simple. But I think if we provide energy, first of all, it'll, the tendency will be to leave the forest alone, okay? Uh, fuel wood, whether we import it or whatever you do. I mean, so you're, you're satisfying the immediate need for chopping down the trees. Of course, the underlying root cause is 80% of the people live below the poverty level. I'm just not that smart. Uh, again, I don't know how to fix that necessarily. And I know there are many people trying to do it for a better part of two decades now. Um, so, I mean, for me, the simple, being a physical geographer, the satisfying the simple need is provide fuel wood, provide energy, and perhaps take away the, one of the existing motivations to go after the trees. And, and of course, one of the things you're gonna have to change is land tenure practices. These go all the way back to the French, French colonial era. Who owns the land, who does not? And in a lot of the Caribbean, much of the land holdings are held by a few very powerful people. So that forces poor people off into marginal lands and, or they pay exorbitant costs to rent a farm. Yes? I'm just wondering, um, because there's so much, I mean, they've destroyed like so much of their own land, but with the Dominican right there, is that gonna be detrimental to them eventually? Like wouldn't, it benefit them to help them, but is this now getting into government stuff? Well, I, again, I, I, I have never been there. I understand one of the real issues is migration into the Dominican Republic. Uh, in the Dominican Republic, you know, they kind of sealed off the border after the earthquake. It was like people say, every, you know, I mean, I'm being very facetious, but they, they really did that. And, and so I think the Dominican Republic is they have their own population problems. They have their own environmental problems. And, and you know, they are they have a, f a fairly vibrant economy, certainly compared to Haiti, but you know they can't absorb, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, the sort of migration. I think they're very. Uh, but will this eventually affect them? I mean, it just seems. Well, I they you know they kind of have the same problems anyway, just because of the environment. I I, th I think the Dominican Republic has devoted. You know, one of the problems with Haiti is it doesn't lack it lacks the institutional structures okay. to enforce environmental regulations, even if they had them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they've invested virtually no money into the social structures to support environmental conservation. Uh, I believe, I may be wrong, but I believe the Dominican Republic has. So I think they're, while they have their share of environmental problems, they are certainly less problematical than they are in Haiti. We have time for one more question, Sue. Okay, one. One more. Yes. Is it silly to think of solving the energy problem by a nuclear power plant? I, I know. There's a lot of problems with it. Earthquakes, hurricanes, government. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, you know, here, here, the nuclear power issue is, is, a, is a great one to talk about. Certainly that would help. You know, it's, 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 it is a clean energy. The safety of that energy source is always going to be a problem. What do we do with fuel? It is tectonically active. But again, as you saw, it's the, the, the number of earthquakes there are relatively rare. 
Heck, I used to live at West Point. We had the Indian Point plant. They built right on a fault, you know. Pretty, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know so it's, relatively speaking, yeah, that would certainly solve a lot of general electrical problems. Now, again, there's there's issues with securing nuclear materials and, and on and on and on and on. So I, you know, but any form of I, I would suspect, again, my simple approach would be any form of electricity would certainly lower the burden on the forest mm -hmm. in the area. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Very much.